So, um, okay. So we've been using this word outliers. You're probably wondering what we actually mean by this. Um, yeah, what, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I was hoping you guys would tell me. Um, so, yeah, the word outlier, we're looking at anomalies. Who's this guy? You want to know this? Yeah, so what does he do? What's he a big deal? Yeah. Yeah, he's a marathon runner at what age? 104. 104. I think he might be 106 something. He looks ideal. But yeah, so this guy's an anomaly, isn't he? He's what we're calling an outlier. So what does he credit his success to as a runner? Diet. Exactly. What about his diet is his key message? Exactly. He eats child sized portions. So this is a guy who has figured out by himself what kind of diet he needs. The intention that he has been doing. So he's clearly exceptional. And if you look at the data, this is, I mean, I'm, I'm a data monkey, this is what I get kicks out of. So he's not even on this scale. Look, that finishes at about 75, and I pointed at 75, but he's nowhere near that. Right? This is a distribution of everyone who's a marathon runner. So, for Justin, when you look at the data, he's an outlier. And when you think about the fact that he's accomplished so much, you would think that there's a lot of lessons to learn from him, right? And therefore there's a lot of lessons to learn from outliers. But when it comes to modern medicine, switch. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to modern medicine, they just totally ignore the outliers. There's, there's basically, there's nothing to learn from them. We are only concerned with everything else. Those little dots at the edges, they're not really relevant. Why is that? So, our, our focus in modern medicine is about what's the norm and how to get you back to the norm, right? So we're worried about people who are really, really sick on the end of the spectrum and the average one has to get those back. When someone's doing really well, why would we worry about that? That's not the concern. That's not why you come to see us. And the data that we, that we generate to inform the interventions that we use are from clinical trials and they focus on groups of sick patients of a specific age range maybe or, you know, defined severity of illness. And what you're really doing in those situations is trying to develop you know, highly specific drugs that target a specific molecule in your body that either amplify the effect or negate the effect that that has. Right? So if you're trying to look at the bigger picture here, so let's take an example that's of current interest. There's been a lot of talk in the media and some, and, and some big companies about aging and how do we reverse it. Is there a drug that can cure aging? Now, I did a study on this uh, in 2015. And how many mechanisms do you see up there that are involved in aging? Ten. They're all interlinked. And there are more links than that diagram even shows that have come to the fore in research since. If I'm trying to develop a drug and I hit one of those mechanisms, do you think it's going to impact that picture at all? The likelihood is your body's going to try and compensate. It's going to either amplify the effects of another mechanism to level it out, or there's going to be a knock-on effect. And that's what you experience as side effects with the drugs that you take every day. So, where does it all begin? What can influence the whole of the mechanism rather than just one part? Everything we talked about today. It's what's going into this system that we need to worry about. The lifestyle factors. So, it's interesting as well to consider this point. When you conduct a clinical trial looking at how well a drug is working, you cannot control for these lifestyle factors that we talked about. If you're in my study, I cannot tell you exactly what to eat, exactly how to move, when to relax, and how much you can or cannot sleep. Unless, of course, you're doing a specific study on each of those factors. But you don't do that when you're looking at the efficacy of a drug. So, <laughs> getting back to what makes people extraordinary, maybe if we want to understand what makes people exceptional and extraordinary and live to the age of 104 or 106 or whatever it is now, maybe the lifestyle factors that the clinical trials ignore because they can't interrogate are a really good place to start. And that's where the Outliers Project comes in. So the whole concept behind the Outliers Project is that we identify, share the stories of, and we learn from people with extraordinary health, health outcomes, just like from Justin. So we've got quite a big vision for what the Outliers Project is actually going to do. Firstly, we want to set up a channel for patients, for patients to connect with relatable stories that they can use to empower their health. What this basically means is, if you've got diabetes, or if you have rheumatoid arthritis, you want to be able to connect with someone who has, or rather had, those things, 
and you want to understand how they got to that outcome. Those are the people that you relate to, it's their lessons that you can learn from. On top of that, we hope that it can be a useful platform for clinicians like myself to learn from the extraordinary and apply that to our patients. And when you combine both of these, what you should hopefully get is a movement for extraordinary health, health outcomes to be the norm. So both working with the clinician side of things and working with patients directly it should hopefully be a lot of harmony. So, um, this is just a precursor for the kind of thing we're looking to put out there. So, this is a story of a man who I'm proud to call my uncle. His name is Hajinder Mathari. He's a chap who, back in 2000, was diagnosed with panicolitis. He had ulcers throughout his bowel, and his whole work-life balance was just totally out of kilter. He was given two options, take steroids or have surgery. And the surgery would have left him with a shortened bowel and it coming, everything coming out into a bag from the stomach. He decided to take things into his own hands. He threw, he threw away the steroids after taking one pill and then looked into other interventions that he felt were more aligned with his value set. Three months, he just had makili roti, so corn flour, and then yogurt. And in that, after that time frame, he gradually reintroduced foods as per his body's response. He's never had a problem since. And actually, the only reason he's not on our patient panel today is because he's at Everest Base Camp. So, once an outlier, always an outlier. And these are the people we want to learn from. Okay, so how do we get involved? How are we moving forward with this? Uh, we have a website, outliershealth.org. Go there, sign up, keep in touch with the mailing list. If you have a story of your own that you believe is of value to other patients around the world, we want to hear it. Um, and even if you don't, we all know someone that has. Mobilize people, let's get this movement going. And then, if you haven't already, hopefully this is a prompt for you to start implementing things today. Start documenting your journey and let's build up that we can share stories in the future. Thanks. Yeah, thank you.